Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Lily Clark has struggled with anorexia nervosa. Anorexia for me, it was never really about getting skinny and the aesthetic. It was more about just controlling what my body was doing, whether that was, you know, growing muscle or gaining weight or developing breasts or whatever. It was just, I wanted to be in control of that. For her, anorexia was a 10-year battle. Next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. And it's our, our pleasure now to be joined by Lily Clark. Lily, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you for having me. As we mentioned in our introduction, Lily, you have lived a decade of, of hell. And what I want to talk to you about is, and learn as much as we can possibly about, is this thing called anorexia that you um, that has afflicted you but I want to start in the beginning I want to start back when you were a child this is something that you've dealt with with a long time but in Lander Wyoming you you were here as a child and things were looking pretty good for you early yeah I was the traditional bright bubbly energized child um, it was a very picturesque childhood um, and uh, that lasted until about 12, when I was about 12 in sixth grade. And um, then the light switch turned off, I guess. And tell me, tell me about that, Lily, when you were at such a young age, at a time when most teens are trying to find themselves, this happened to you. What happened? It was um, the start of sixth grade. I was 10, 12 or 11 or 12, and um, all of a sudden I was much more aware of how much space I took up in the world. And I was never a, a large child. I was always very athletic and very average sized. I was like smack in the middle for height. Um, and um, it was, you, you, I started becoming more aware of other girls because they started, you know, you start developing for puberty. You start getting hips and you start, you know, developing breasts. And I was just kind of looking at that and I was like, I don't, want to grow up yet. I wasn't ready for that dramatic of a change because it sounded horrific because they had just started teaching you in health, you know, like puberty, which basically made it sound like you're getting a plague for a decade. Um, and I wanted a way to control my life because it felt like I was going to lose control of my body. And, you know, any, any child in America knows um, it's familiar in some way, shape, or form with diet culture, and you just kind of, and I just kind of went down that avenue. And you know, there there are always r food rules surrounding you. And when you become old enough to start processing, when you kind of lose your ego, when you as you mature, um, you start realizing that there's a lot of input on how you should look and how much space you should take up. And anorexia for me, although never really. A, it was never really about getting skinny and the aesthetic. It was more about just controlling what my body was doing, whether that was growing taller or, you know, growing muscle or gaining weight or developing breasts or whatever. It was just, I wanted to be in control of that. So you're going through junior high. Mm -hmm. You're with friends. No. How was well, your, tell yes. Me, tell me how your life was. Um, so sixth grade, I started developing my eating disorder. The summer of that year, I was taken down to Denver Children's Hospital for a six-week treatment. This is something then your family recognized? Um, yeah, my mom and my, and my dad kind of started noticing that I was withdrawing more in sixth grade and I was very stressed out and very unhappy and I, I started developing body dysmorphia, which is where you, know, you, you don't see what's actually there and you don't feel what's actually there. Um, and that was also part of the Aspergers as well. And my family has always celebrated food. We've always been, you know, lo we've loved cooking. We've loved learning about how, you know, how cooking is transformative and how it, you know, and the chemistry behind it. And so to have your daughter start to 
you know, say, I don't want butter on my toast. I don't want, you know, peanut butter. You know, it's to have your star daughter start to do that is kind of raises some red flags. And they took me to a doctor and a therapist because I also started losing a lot of weight and it wasn't growing. I wasn't, gr it wasn't weight loss due to growing up. Mm -hmm. It was just, um, you weren't eating. I was, I was wasting away in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. so at that point I didn't see anorexia as a bad thing. I didn't think I was sick. I was, I was just, you know, different. Did your teachers understand what was happening to you? No. Um, I don't, it's, it's really, it's a malicious disease. You can hide it if you want to. And most people do want to because you don't want to get better for the majority of it. You, you like it. It gives you control. It makes you feel powerful. Um, you kind of feel adrenaline rushes from, you know, not having to eat like everyone else. And you kind of feel empowered by that. And like you have a secret and it's just kind of seductive in that manner. So what was a good day for you then when you were in, in middle school? Not being bullied was fantastic. Um, By girls and, and boys? Or? Yeah, it was pretty across the board, even across the board. Um, there was a lot of bullying because when you have uh, OCD and body dysmorphia and Asperger's in the sense that you do like routines and you are sensitive to fabrics and with body dysmorphia, if you have one day where you feel good about how you look, that's an incredible day. That is a very fantastic moment. And so um, I wore a uniform with clothes I kind of felt comfortable with. And that's weird, that's different. You know, not everyone does that, and especially when you're not in a school that does uniforms. And, um, and not eating with people during lunch was also, you know, weird. And so it was a lot of bullying. So I don't think a good day in middle school actually <laughs> exists, yeah, except you're doing, going home. You're doing well in school though at the time. Yeah. I never di didn't do well in school because I kind of just adopted the um, scholastic baton, I guess. We've always done school well in school in my family. Um, I just kind of used my ability to obsess over something and just kind of applied that to school. And, and we're talking with Lily Clark and we're talking about anorexia. Lily, something you um, first experienced when you were 12 through middle school, now you're in high school. Mm -hmm. What is your life like in high school? Um, kind of perking up because you've got braces off and uh, although then again that doesn't mean you can restrict as easily so um perking up in the sense that not because bullying was lessened but because i was getting to a weight that i liked i was getting to an aesthetic i was getting to a body that i felt more comfortable in um, very skinny yeah and I, I want to point out to our viewers that it's important that we really don't talk and focus on numbers yes. in the show. Lily, why is that? Because typically anorexics are incredibly competitive. And if you give numbers, if you present certain images, if you, you know, say, I didn't eat this and this and this and lost this much weight, by doing that, you kind of present a guidebook for someone who is suffering with an eating disorder. And they'll be like, oh, that worked for that person. And in terms of... Um, showing, you know, before and after photos that A, takes away from the aspect of recovery entirely, but it also focuses on what you look like. And you think that I can't possibly be sick enough to get help. I can't possibly be sick. I can't possibly have this eating disorder if I don't look like this or if I don't look like that. And so you kind of want to remove the entire image component away from that. This is a good time, Lily, I think, to talk about the numbers yeah. that are afflicted by anorexia. We're not talking about a few dozen Americans here. No, you're talking about at least 30 million in the United States alone. Primarily women? Yeah, typically, but although, but men, but men, and that's, this is eating disorders in total. There are about 30 million people in the United States that have eating disorders, whether that's bulimia, anorexia, binge eating, eating disorders not otherwise specified, which is the harder one to diagnose. Um, it affects men, women, any race, any gender, any sexuality. If you get treatment? It's imp it, if it, Treatment is ridiculously expensive. My parents had to pay, you know, somewhere around $100,000 for my treatment. And um, if you have the means and you can do it, you can. But insurance is rather stingy about it. You ran the numbers of just here in Lander, and your guesstimate is that how many people may statistically 
Well, on, on average, one in 200 um, American women have an eating have anorexia specifically. And so in a town of around 7,500, which is Lander's population roughly, that would break down to 37 to 38 women, and I used to be one of them. And there is not treatment really available in Wyoming? Nowhere in Wyoming. Um, not, not, not inpatient treatment. There are a few therapists that are familiar with it, but there's no one who's specifically spe specialized that I have ever found. Mm -hmm. I had to go to Denver both times for my treatment. And you're, you're 22 years old now, yes. so you were in high school in the era, era of social media. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm secretly 80, though, so I didn't really have social media in high school. Um, I didn't really care to. I, I, I was so happy to graduate. It wasn't even funny. Um, to leave something behind? To, well, tradi <laughs> traditionally in our family, to find people, to find our quote-unquote tribe, to find people that we understand how we are. Um, it usually happens in college and not in Lander, not in Wyoming. Um, that happened for my parents at college, that happened for my sister at college, and I was like, that'll happen for me at college. It didn't happen for me at college. You went, you, you went away for school the first time around? I did. I went, um, I went down to Salt Lake mm -hmm. to a very small liberal arts college, and it uh, spectacularly blew up in my face, as it were. Um, the su after I graduated from high school, I, um, I spent that summer trying to self-recover, which is an oxymoron in terms. <laughs> Again, the whole time recognizing that you suffer from, you knew that you suffered from anorexia. Yeah, I diagnosed myself with um, Asperger's as well, and then presented that data to a therapist, and they're like, Oh, that's why you're an atypical anorexic. Were you seeing a physician at this time? Were you, were you getting medical advice? No, not really. Mostly because I just had a. I, I've I've never been a fan of doctors. I've never liked that clinical setting. Um, I, I I did see a doctor on and off because I was on antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds at the time, um, and you had to do you know the check-in of like, do you want to kill yourself? No, maybe others. I don't know. You know, like you you had to do those check-ins. Um, but the, uh, that wasn't necessarily true. You, you've had some thoughts of suicide. I've had a few attempts of suicide, yeah. And was that in your college age time? Yeah, that was, that was when I was at college um, both times around, really. So. And you're in Salt Lake at, at school. Yes. You realized at one time that, that it wasn't going to work out for you there. And then what happened I next? Never, I never particularly realized it. I didn't want it to not work out. Um, I was having extreme bullying within my dorm room and within the college itself. Living with three other women? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was going to be four, but the other girl was smart enough not to show up, and I regret that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there was a lot of bullying inside the dorm. There was a lot of bullying just within, um, I was in a, the honors, honor society, and it was a cutthroat track. Um, and the bullying kind of made me withdraw a lot more and restrict a lot more because I was like, I can control this misery. Um, and I started, I, I kind of verged, I, I went into orthorexia, which is healthy eating done anorexically. Like, I don't think that's a verb. But, um, and over exercising because I took refuge in any place that wasn't my dorm room, which just so happened to be the gym. <laughs> so. And you didn't exercise just a little bit. No. Um, since probably the summer of eighth grade, I would wake up every morning at three and work out until about six, six thirty, and then go down and pretend to have breakfast alone and then go to school. And I, the whole time, breakfast really wasn't breakfast. Breakfast never happened. It was, you know, crumbs on a plate. It was, you know, it, it was an telling your folks, yeah, I had some cereal or, or whatever. <laughs> it was a very staged crime scene of eating in that <laughs> sense. It was like, of course I had food. I put it in the dishwasher. So. After school or after your time in Salt Lake, you're, you're back to Lander. What was the next decision? Um, a solid six to eight months of therapy, like three times a week because I had an emotion. I, I, had, I had the symptoms of PTSD when I came back um, from Westminster that my parents 
took me out of. I never made the decision to leave Westminster. That was an executive decision my mom and my sister made to come and get me and take me home because they they knew I had made one like they they had a they had guessed I had made at least one suicide attempt at that point. So. And you're a person who still was trying to control this component of your life. Yeah. You came back to Lander. You tried school again. Uh yeah, the fall that following school year, I then went to UW after flaming out for the first time. And um, that fall semester, I made Dean's List. I still was restricting. I was still doing all of those um, over-exercising aspects and food behaviors. And then spring semester, I got the flu or mono. I'm not really sure which. And um, I was still really restricting at that time. And then um, I started noticing I couldn't remember things. And I started noticing that I was struggling in class and that what was being taught wasn't sticking. Which was weird for you. Yeah, I, have, I, had always been, I had always been great in school and to all of a sudden not be able to understand what was being taught or remember what was being presented or do homework was really weird for me. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I, I had done enough research prior to know that you know, you, your brain usually is the first to start to kind of fade. Because um, at this point, I am below the average, you know, the underweight BMI. I am, I am way incredibly low. Okay, so you, you knew that dementia uh, at some level was, was starting to impact your life, mm -hmm. yet... Nothing. I, I did not have the... the um, I did not decide to that maybe I should look into getting better and giving up the eating disorder that never that never once crossed my mind at, at that time no and all of a sudden more physical problems then uh yeah uh, i started having a lot of um heart problems it i could feel it you know um, skipping my chest i could feel it pounding or the the more scary one was when it was really really slow and it's like oh my god is there not going to be another heartbeat and then it would eventually come on and you'd be like oh okay we're okay for now um and I started to become really scared of going to bed at night because I was pretty sure I was starting to experience heart failure. And I was terrified that if I went to sleep, I would die. And you would call home every night? Crying, yeah. Cry, calling home every night and crying was a theme throughout both attempts at college. Yet you still hadn't processed that you were, you, you knew you were sick, but you weren't ready yet to have help? Am at, I getting that right? At that point, it's really scary to ask for help. It's really scary to be like, I am, I'm willing to give up this, you know, this boa constrictor I've been lugging around with me for the past decade. Um, because, you know, the pain you know is better than the pain you don't. And I, I had done a ton of research about relapse rates and what goes on in recovery and how recovery works and the, you know, the weight gain associated with recovery and, you know, all of that and I didn't want to give up that control I didn't want to have to go into a treatment center and completely surrender myself and become a kid again because you know to relearn how to eat at 22 you were know, you hungry um no you don't at, when you first start restricting you feel like anyone who's been on a diet those first couple weeks are absolute torture and then eventually your body's like oh this is a famine okay, we won't torture you mentally that much, so we'll, you know, we'll hide your hunger cues and you won't feel hungry and you won't feel full and you just won't feel anything internally in more ways than one. Mm. So there was a time in Laramie, though, that, um, that something changed for you. Edema is an interesting experience. Um, if, I, if I had thought that my, you know, erratic heartbeat was a sign of heart failure, the edema kind of confirmed that. I had um, severe pitting edema from my feet all the way up through my thighs. and um, Still getting up at 3 a.m.? Still getting up at 3 a.m. On the treadmill? On the treadmill. Going too. crazy? Yep. Every, you know, even if, it, even if I had the edema, which makes shoes really uncomfortable to wear, which makes walking really, really hard because you're, it's like your legs are wrapped in memory foam because it, you know, anything stents in it and it's... Um, and it didn't, it, and it wouldn't go away. I had experienced bloating because anyone who abuses laxatives or diuretics will experience that um, 
when incredibly malnourished. So I was familiar with the aspect of bloating and retaining water, but edema was a different creature altogether. And so, altogether, but. You had come home to Lander for a weekend? Uh, yeah, in uh, June, I think, because after- Under the promise of, that you would go back to Lander? <laughs> Well, I was I was staying in Laramie that summer because I was in such I had such horrible I'll call it dementia for lack of a better word because I, my brain just would not function for spring semester I I had to take all incompletes um, minus two courses. That's never happened to you. I've never gotten a C. I've never gotten a D. I've never gotten an F, and I got all of those spring semester, and that was heartbreaking because I've never had an identity other than Lily is the smart kid you know if you know I was never the I was never the popular one or the pretty one or the athletic one or the you know funny one I was like if you the smart kid that's Lily um, so to lose that identity it was just kind of like great now all, all my identity is is that I have an eating disorder so so tell me what happened you came home for a weekend and um, yeah, I came home to get some of my um, some clothes because I had taken over my sister's apartment in Laramie because I was going to work through the summer and finish my incompletes because I'm not sick at all. Um, and then I discovered I was having problems walking and I couldn't really stand and my mother had still been like, you should go see a doctor. And I was like, no, no, you said I could go back to Laramie to finish and I, I, I need to finish my classes and I need to stick with my jobs because, you know, people are depending on me. And we drove to Laramie um, and fought the entire time from Lander to Laramie, which is a very long fight. Um, and we, we stopped outside of my apartment and my mom's like, if you walk in there, you're not going to walk out. You know, like if you, if you go back into that apartment, that's it. You aren't going to, you know, you aren't going to survive the summer. Because I, I was at that point where my, like I had, I had the muscle mass and, of someone with stage four terminal cancer. Like I was. The bone density of an 80 year old. Yeah, I had severe osteoporosis, although I didn't know it yet at that time. <clears throat> so your mother's telling you goodbye. In a lot of ways, um, yeah. She was like, she, was, she made it very clear. She was basically like, if you walk into there, I'm going to have to leave and you're gonna die. And it was just kind of like, and at that point I was just kind of like, well, it might be a nice reprieve, which isn't something you should tell your mother in any situation that death would be a nice reprieve. Um, and I walked into my apartment, well, hobbled would be an accurate term, um, and then crawled because it was upstairs and I couldn't walk upstairs. So I crawled up the stairs into the apartment and she couldn't leave. She came back in and she was like, let me take you to to someone who can help you. And we won't, you know, and, and, and at that point it was kind of bargaining with the disease. It was like, you won't have to gain, you know, weight to a healthy weight that you want to, because in anorexia, you don't want to become healthy. You don't want to gain that weight um, to just an average healthy weight. Like, you know, but you're, in your brain, when you have an eating disorder, you're like anything, you know, anything in the healthy range is obese, is, is fat, is you're going to die from that. The decision then, not maybe directly, but indirectly for you was, I'm going to get help. Yeah, at, at that point, um, my kind of resolve had started to crack in terms of restricting um, my, you know, my normal kind of safe foods weren't, I started feeling more kind of um, craving, I guess. I, I, I used to never have cravings. And then I remember, again, in June, when I started getting the edema, when I started being scared to go to sleep at night because I might not see, you know, I might have to say goodbye to my parents and my family. Like, when I started going through all of that, I also started having, like, phantom dreams of smelling, you know, my favorite foods. And I would spend, you know, hours at night on, like, food blogs just looking at food. Like, some people have pornography, but for an anorexic, it's food blogs because that stuff is just, like, you're, like, looking at it and you're like, I want that. And that and that and I made like this list of like if I were ever to survive and beat this I want to eat these again <laughs> and I should point out that and this is this is true I've never met anyone who understands more about nutrition yeah than you that which I think is so counterintuitive 
there's an obsession to it because um, I knew when I was restricting, I knew I was depriving my body of calcium and minerals and vitamins and I knew how important electrolytes were for my heart to function and for my nerves to work and I was like okay and I knew how important fish oil was for my brain like that was my main thing is like I knew that fish oil was really important for my brain and I needed CoQ10 for my heart and I it was like I took anywhere from 25 to like 30 vitamins a day because I knew that like I might be starving myself but I was going to make sure that it ran as well as it could for as long as it could um, which ended up making my bones my osteoporosis, not as bad as it would have for someone who had done to the extremes that I had gone to. But you're home now, sleeping 20 hours a day, waiting for treatment. With my mother checking in on me every hour for Wondering my Wondering whether you're alive, <laughs> Yeah. right? Yeah. Just like a mother might be to her brand new child. It was very much so. It was, it was that very much so. Um, and then uh, I remember one night, I was, I was like, I, I had just woken up and my mom had come to like, she was keeping track, she was keeping a log of my, um, my pulse and my heart rate because it was very tachycardic at that point. Um, and I was like, I'm hungry. And she's like, and, 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 and so this is where it gets really, this is where the like absolute cruelty of anorexia comes into play because it takes away your hunger when you're, you know, relatively healthy, normal weight, and, and it, it, it makes it disappear when you're underweight. And then when you hit that wall, when you're like on that precipice between death and like barely living, it brought back kind of my urge to eat. Because like, despite how, how malicious this illness is, you still have that, you know, human drive to survive no matter what. You know, you still drink water, you know, even if you aren't thinking about it. So they're, you know, right on that precipice from like, I, I could die this month or I can live there was this sudden urge for peanut butter specifically a peanut butter bagel and at that point I hadn't had bread in nine years I hadn't had peanut butter in ten and so when you when you refeed someone who's had anorexia for a really long time and who and who is ridiculously malnourished and who has tachycardia and who has edema and who has all these signs that her organs are starting to shut down you run into the risk of refeeding syndrome which is basically your body not being able to handle food, your heart going into shock, and you die. And so it's like the one time you're actually hungry, you could die from it. And that is heartbreakingly tragic because the one time you are ready and willing to eat, you can't, not, not to the degrees that you want to when you're that starved and that emaciated and that absolutely malnourished. Um, For someone who's watching today, someone who's watching right now, and they're wondering if they're going down a similar path. What do you say to them today? Um, courage, dear heart. Um, you, it's gonna hurt. I, I wouldn't that. It's, you're, it's going to absolutely be the hardest thing you will ever do in your life and recovery is going to be painful but it's not going to be painful as dying. <laughs>